<laughs> so Good. I think we are live and uh, I'm just going to go ahead. I hear that we are on and uh, I just wanted to welcome you to tonight's second episode of Let's Talk Media with uh, Paula Bronstein, who is a fantastic uh, photographer with an international reputation. And she's going to talk about the power of documenting in the moment. Um, this web series is produced in partnership with Digital Media Connecticut and a new group of Connecticut women. And we call ourselves Badass Female Filmmakers, BFFs. Through this web series, aspiring filmmakers and media professionals are invited to join Connecticut women in live conversations via YouTube and talk about their careers in independent documentary filmmaking and photography. Each episode features an hour of conversation followed by 30 minutes of questions from the virtual audience. As tonight's episode evolves, please take advantage of your YouTube chat box to submit questions to the panelists, which we will ask during the Q&A section after the panel discussion. So we have several people standing by in the uh, chat room to channel your questions. So among them are Dr. Agnes Morshi and uh, Jennifer Boyd. Let me introduce myself quickly. I'm Karen Ritzenhoff. I'm a professor in the Department of Communication at Central Connecticut State University and teach classes on global visual communication and film studies. I often focus on war films and this is why I was so excited to be the one to interview Paula Bronstein. Paula Bronstein is one of the world's leading female photojournalists. With a career that spans over three decades, she uses her vision to document humanity bringing awareness to issues throughout the world, focusing in many conflict regions. She is the author of the internationally acclaimed book, Afghanistan Between Hope and Fear. I actually ordered it from Amazon here. And I think it's one of the most beautiful photo books I have seen. The title image is also going to be shown as part of today, today's discussion, um, a woman from Afghanistan. Um, Paula has worked as a staff photographer for a variety of American newspapers for 15 years, moving overseas to the Asian region in the late 1990s. She joined Getty Images as a senior staff photographer from 2002 to 2013, and she's currently working as a freelancer. Her images have been published in almost every globally recognized publication and exhibited in numerous countries. What is really exciting is that Paula's work is currently exhibited um, in two different places on the ground. And what is extraordinary is that um, she is covering the Rohingya refugees and one exhibit is taking place in Iran in, an, uh, in a gallery outside of Tehran. And I have some information here that she shared on her Facebook this is the first time that I've had a show in this country. Curators Hassan and Hussein Roshan Bakht um, are twin brothers who operate the gallery. Hussein Farmani, founder and president of Lucy Foundation, is the owner of this art space in Kashan, just a few hours from Tehran. So those are her pictures on the wall. And the second exhibit that is also currently going on is actually in Dubrovnik, and uh, it is uh, an exhibit where you also have to go actually to Dubrovnik to see it, um, but uh, we are going to post a link for you to look at it. Tonight, um, Paula is going to show um, an extensive selection of her pictures that she took in Portland. She has been on the ground in the United States for several weeks and uh, has fantastic pictures. And then we are going to move after those pictures to her international coverage. And uh, I just want to say welcome, Paula. Thank you. Let's talk. Thank you. It's a great intro. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, so we have um, um, a good dozen of people in YouTube live, but I know that uh, since we are record recording this live, many students will join us and um, see your work, Paula, which is so inspiring. Um, so I want to remind the audience to please type your questions for um, Jennifer Boyd and Carol Evans and uh, Agnes uh, Moshi into the chat box so that they can answer those questions in the question and answer section. 
and we will begin with that section at six o'clock. And now it's time to get started. So this picture, the first picture that we are seeing was published in July as the cover page of the Washington Post. So maybe Paula, you can describe to us um, when you took that picture and uh, your experiences of covering the protests. Right, and we can just kind of run through maybe a number of the photos so that the viewers get the sense of the different kinds of images. So, so I think everybody knows these, these protests became national news uh, once the story, they had been actually going on for quite some time before the country and I would say they became international news uh, because it was so unprecedented for federal agents to start rounding up protesters. Uh, it didn't look like images that you would see in the United States. Um, and so the protests, as you can see here in this picture, the protests really increased in size and in scope. And, and uh, in Portland, it's a very liberal minded city where protest is kind of part of the culture, but uh, people were very much united in not in it. You had the Black Lives Matter protests that were ongoing, but then this whole federal agent pro protest became feds go home, get them out of Portland, uh, or at least keep them off the streets. Uh, and, and here we see a veteran. So there are many groups at these protests, which I found fascinating. This was a veterans group and they would come on and march together. So all these different groups, you had the moms group, which, be, which got tons of press. Uh, you're gonna see a, a photo of some of the mom protesters and, and, you know, and they started something that, that just caught on fire because they were, you know, saying, hey, we are, mothers with kids and we care about how our kids grow up and 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 we want the best for our city and et cetera et cetera and they believe and yeah and here she is one of the moms so you know it just fantastic to see them out there they were always in the front line they uh very unified with in their voice and and very much a part of the black lives matter protest too but they're, they're at this point, at the height of these protests, there were very distinct issues. It, it was Black Lives Matter and this federal issue that was really bothering a lot of people throughout the US is this idea that this current administration could, you know, do things that are just not known in the US in terms of, uh, you know, what we all depend on, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the idea that, you know, if you, you, I mean, here you go. Here's another, here's another picture of the mom. It's good to concentrate on the moms because they're so fantastic. First time I had seen this in a protest before. So part of the, the what, you know, these groups really created such a sense of solidarity. You know, I, I, I thought that was just wonderful. Paula, when we did our pre-interview two weeks ago, you mentioned that there was excessive violence. Um, and uh, you are, of course, as a war photographer, somebody who doesn't shy away from crisis situations. But did you expect this kind of violence on American streets because you've been living overseas so long? Well, you know, what immediately started coming up right after the death of George Floyd is, is, is you know, this whole defunding of police, the, the fact that they're so militarized. I have to agree with that from what I've seen here. The excessive use of tear gas, come on. Right now, I wasn't at the protest last night, but the first thing of, uh, another photographer told me, oh, there was a lot of tear gas last night. I'm thinking, wait a minute, how many protesters were there? Like 300? I mean, you know, I don't, really understand it. I'm really, really against it. And I feel it's extremely excessive use of force. 
there are ways to control a crowd without using tear gas unless you absolutely have to. Now at the, you know, all these photographs you'll look at, you're looking at are from the federal building area. So we were only talking about an area right downtown by the federal buildings. Now the protest locations have changed. Now they're actually in precincts. They're happening nearby precincts, which means they're in residential areas. So you can imagine that you might want to limit the use of tear gas in residential areas. Let's think about that. <laughs> Paul, you know? One of the things that you mentioned also is that there are lots of photographers who were part of the Black Lives Matter protests in Minneapolis where George Floyd was murdered and then just took their iPhones and came to Portland and uh, there was a huge turnout of young people and you said that uh, in, some, in some ways that they were rookies so to say on the street but uh, when you work along young photographers, what are some of your concerns um, in terms of their experience or lack of experience? Yeah, well, I, I want to correct you because I don't know if that happened exactly. I'm just saying there, first of all, I think at any big news event, you're going to see emerging photographers hitting the streets who are very passionate about, uh, especially if, if, if photojournalism is going to be their career, whether it's video or stills. I think they want to be part of it. They want to be, they want to challenge themselves and their respect, which is really, really important because that's how you gain experience, right? So it's a matter of, can you do it safely? And can you, do you have the knowledge to make sure that you can stay safe? I don't mean just knowledge about the protest, but it does help wherever you are to have that necessary idea of, okay, what might happen here? What are my chances of being arrested? And if I do get arrested, um, are my parents, parents going to bail me out? I mean, what's going to happen here? So um, during the protest, when the when when you know at the federal building, actually, I didn't fear being arrested because I felt like there was, you know, there was a sense of dialogue between the federal agents and the professional photographers. I think, they, I think they actually had a sense of which one of us were not activists because a lot of people, it's very easy to put on, you know, take some duct tape, write press and, and try to blend in with other media. And that's kind of what I was saying that was, became an issue. And, and it's a problem for us because we need to be seen as professionals doing our job And also, if someone asks, if, 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 a, if you are asked to move onto the sidewalk or if you're asked to do something, you have to take that into consideration. Okay, you know, is this a fair request? In that case, of course, all the media would move out of the way. So we're not, you know, nobody wants to get arrested. It's just that in the past week or so, two different members of the media have been arrested here. And again, we're talking about protests that moved away from the federal building into uh, the area, different areas of the city uh, concentrating on specific precincts. Uh, so, so I was quite disturbed by that. And I felt like there was in indiscriminate arrest going on and, and with no accountability. So the only reason I'm going back tonight is that I feel that there's less of a threat of that right now. It seems like the district attorney um, brought about some rules so that the, it, it could lessen the threat of people. You know, why, why do they want to keep arresting these people? It just adds to more backlog within their own court systems and God knows what, you know, and, and unless some, um, unless the kids are, unless I don't mean to go, call them kids because they're all different ages. Unless the protesters are doing some kind of criminal acts, you know, whether it's trespassing or destruction of property, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's another matter. But if people are protesting peacefully on the streets, why are we tear gassing them? And what's the motive of arrest? Yeah. So, so 
when we talked just before tonight, you said tonight you're going to go out on the street again because I feel like it. <laughs> and we discussed very quickly that it, there's a difference between being on assignment and working as a freelancer. Um, can you explain that, so to say, for our audience who's listening, what the difference is for you having worked as a staff photographer in the United States for so many years and then um, being a freelancer and uh, how that affects your, your way of working? Right, so because my career was maybe 80% staff, uh, and the last seven years freelance. Uh, well, first of all, in terms of a protest, again, if you're going into a situation where there is some risk, whatever that risk is, right? Whether it's a conflict or war zone, whether it's just a simple protest happening in a major city in the United States, um, it's important to think about, you know, the why factor. In my case, I'm going because I want to, uh, I want to see the crowd. I want, you know, probably just observe today's, you know, usually the weekend, of course, the protests will increase in size. And the fact that they're still going on, it's worth me taking a look. Um, and if I'm not on assignment, what does that mean? You asked me that. Obviously, as a freelancer, I want to have a client send the pictures to. Um, and so if I don't have a client to send the pictures to, then, you know, I may spend less time there tonight, but it's, I'm going for, you know, just to observe and just to see what's the status of the protest right now and to see whether I want to go there on the weekend. Yeah. So it's, so it's just my choice. I'm here, you know, why not? When I look at your pictures just seen so far, this, so to say, um, uh, a beauty to the to the aesthetics. You know, if you showed the tear gas, but it was like a like a fog, or you showed these, uh, um, it looked like uh, um, lights in the sky. But on the other hand, you also show these extreme close-ups, and that's something that I see in your work on Afghanistan and uh, and Ukraine. That you mm -hmm. love these intimate portraits. So. Do you, um, do you conscientiously choose the close-ups and look at uh, people, so to say, um, in intimate portraits or um, in, a, in, a, in a situation like the protests, do you um, go in and you think, I also want to show the group of people? What, what uh, is your, so to say, professional approach in terms of, of framing and capturing the crisis? Well, you, you know, with the protests, okay, you have to think about, uh, first of all, for me, being in Portland, because I haven't, um, you know, I find it a, f a fascinating place where, as I said, protest is part of the culture, but, you know, just the way people dress up and, and you know, <laughs> when they're coming to a protest, they, they really create this festive atmosphere. Uh, and what was so interesting about the protest downtown was that you'd have maybe a drumming circle or something taking place, um, you know, in one area. And then the next thing you know, the mood starts to change. The recording comes on from the federal buildings declaring it an unlawful assembly or riot, whatever. And then you knew within the, another 30 minutes, probably the jury cast was going to start. And I know it sounds crazy, but it was just that change in mood. But usually early evening, what was so nice is you'd have families come out. Yeah. All the moms would be, you know, amongst the mom protesters. Uh, there would be many of them that would not stay for the tear gas for obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, unless you had a good gas mask, you don't want to stay. It's, it's especially because of uh, coronavirus, actually, it's, it's also another, an added danger is, is how your lungs get affected. 
So, so I think for just people that were prepared and willing to stay, they would. Others would come and observe, enjoy the festivity and the kind of solidarity that it really, really was a nice spirit there. And then maybe by 10 or whatever, before 11, they were gone home because it was obvious what was going to happen. It almost like, uh, you know, a bit theatrical in a way. It was, it was obvious there wasn't a night that was going to go by where there was no tear gas. That was obvious. So no. yeah, yeah I, I'm just painting a picture here is that anybody who, who, who wanted to join could, but, but, you know, you would never see the families stay later than a certain time for their own. It's interesting so also in your work, um, Paula, as we're looking at it, is that uh, you have the, the um, you know, the combat troops. Here we're looking at one where the police is wearing camouflage and then you have the protester with, with roses. So you create this opposition between the police force and uh, the protesters. Um, and so that's a choice that you make, that you show this, uh, um, this tension between the peaceful protesters and this incredible military presence. And you oh. saw it with the flag picture too, the protester waving the flag. Um, um, the roses, you know, the, the flowers, and this shot to me is very Hong Kong protest-esque, you know, to me, uh, because uh, first of all, the protesters were black as they did in Hong Kong. Some of the younger protesters are similar age, college students, uh, like the Hong Kong protesters. So the, that it was funny and, and they adapted some methods with the umbrellas. They were using umbrellas, as you can see, and it wasn't raining. <laughs> that, that was really to protect them from, uh, you know, direct tear gas or whatever. So, so I thought that was really interesting because I covered the Hong Kong protests as well. So if you go back to the other image with the flowers, I think that's a really, well, both of those, they're both saying similar things, but it's that line of protesters, line of uh, police. And, and what I enjoy is when protesters aren't just yelling obs obscenities, et cetera. They're actually trying to do something like, it's a symbol. It, the, the roses are a symbol, a symbol of what? A symbol of peace. The flag is a symbol, you know, it's, it's an American symbol. So again, it's protesters trying to say something and, def and, 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 and showing the police that they're not afraid of them. So you get this kind of, you know, face off, which is part of, it was part of the nightly protest, no doubt. It's just that sometimes what I observed is late, the later it caught in the evening, you know, the things that were said and, and, and shouted, you know, it, it just got more and more nasty, you know? So, so you, so, and that's with any protest, I think anywhere, you're going to have, you know, the, you're going to just have people with different agendas, you know, protesters that have a different frame of mind and, and are, are again, different agenda, different, you know, their mission is different. Um, and, and to them, maybe, you know, being able to, to deal with the tear gas on a nightly basis to, you know, being on the front line of those protests is the most important to make their statement heard, to make sure that, you know, and, and what I was talking about, this is Portland, this is very Portland. People did, just are so creative in the way they dress and the, a bit of humor is used you know, in, you know, which I, I love to document that. Um, uh, you know, I, doc, I, I, I photographed a taxidermist who actually came to the protest wearing a real bear skin. I mean, I can't call it a costume. It, yeah. She really, she, you know, we're, we're over to Ukraine, so we probably have to back up. A second. Maybe we should back up one more time. So one of the things, um, Paula, is that your, your photography is incredibly visceral. So there's always some kind of touch. You, you talked about the sound, but it almost is like we can hear the sound on the street. So you have 
a style of photographing that is full of contextual details and full of symbolism. And uh, um, I thought all, even the two protesters with their, um, with their tear gas masks leaning into each other, it's almost romantic, you know, it's like, uh, like these moments that you capture because you see it. It's somebody else would just go and, and create a cliche, but you're interested in the things that you recognize that are different. Yeah, so, and the messages, trying to get the, that visual message across that there's different moments happening within a protest. It's not just about the tear gas. Yes. And it's not just about the occasional violence that was happening because people were getting injured uh, because there was way too much tear gas. And with that, you, and, and the munitions that were, you know, there were pellet guns and, and media were being injured as well. And I, I got injured myself. I'm fine now. But it was just wrong time, wrong place. I did not get shot by a pellet gun or anything. Um, I, I, caught, caught, I got body slammed by a federal ag agent because it was just wrong time, wrong place. That can happen. It's another element of how, you know, as prepared as you can be or as ex experienced as you can be, things can still happen. They're out of, pretty much out of your control. You know, oh, I have to say something very mundane because uh, our fantastic uh, um, facilitator, um, Heather Elliott Famularo, who is the chair of digital media at Yukon, just sent us a little message that the jewelry that you're wearing that is so exquisite is, is clinkling and cl clankling. So oh, <laughs> you, have to, you have to take out the, the, the bracelets, take off the bracelets. We I think are, it's just this. Was it just this, Heather? Yes, it's good. Now it's good. I hear it. Okay. So. Paula, we are at uh, halfway, so to say, during our our interview. And I think you build a bridge to your international coverage. And you mentioned that you um, have covered Hong Kong protests before. And this is kind of leading us to the next part of uh, your work is your international coverage. And one thing that I thought was really interesting tonight is that you said that even when you were here in Connecticut, working for the Hartford Current, you already took a leave of absence for two and three months, guaranteeing that you had a job when you came back. But you've always been, so to say, um, a migrating bird. You've always been attracted to go outside of your comfort zone. And tell us about it, because I think for students, who we also try to reach with this uh, with this program, it's so scary, this idea to leave everything behind and pack up and go into an area that looks like the picture we are looking at now, where the windows are broken and uh, you hit a different language, a different culture, a different even regime. So tell us a little bit about your overseas reporting. Well, for, for me, it was very important. I don't know if every student is going to, you know, you know, you, look at many, many, many students will reflect back on their time in college, uh, usually with maybe, uh, you know, a, a year they did abroad or whatever, you know, and then the travels uh, they took on uh, during the summer months or whatever, you know, you know, we get back to the challenges and how you want to experience what you want to experience in your career and your life. I mean, for me, um, the, the challenges were definitely more covering a variety of international stories, experiencing different cultures and, and really pushing myself to, and committing myself to, to do stories uh, that spoke about, you know, the human condition that, that are quite often are underreported, like this one that we're, we're moving on to uh, about the elderly in Ukraine uh, and just trying to bring a different perspective and uh, not so much a specifically female one, but in, in depending on the culture, especially Afghanistan, um, my access to do a number of stories on women and human rights issues that face women was because I could gain that access as a female. 
here, here we're, now that we're looking at Ukraine, let's just talk about Ukraine for a second. Um, the story I, I did in Ukraine, I, I, I went there three times. Uh, the funding was uh, grant money. So I was not on assignment with a specific publication to start with. The, so, so the focus is strictly on the elderly. If we go to the next, this is more of a scene set, or if we go to the next image, the, the elderly in Ukraine, Ukraine has the largest number of uh, elderly facing, we should say, you know, affected by war in the world. So what does this mean? It means that the elderly really so much so were left behind. Uh, war, of course, separates families, no matter what country you're talking about. Uh, but in Ukraine, uh, it's, you know, many left eastern part of Ukraine, closer to the, you know, where the war was happening because they, they needed to take their families to safety. The, el the elderly stayed behind. Yeah. And in many cases was, you know, really put themselves into a lot of danger because the, the quality of health care they could receive was very limited. Uh, and they didn't have their families as that, as that you know, is that security net anymore? So, so if we move on to the next picture, a lot, we, what we did, my translator and I, uh, she's a fixer and a translator who set up everything for me. What we did is we went as close to the line of control, the front line as possible. And, and through non-governmental organizations, uh, like the International Red Cross, et cetera, et cetera. We found a number of subjects, elderly, that were that we could go and visit and try to tell their stories, how they were living, you know, so close. We're talking, when I say close, we're talking extremely close uh, to, to where the military positions were. Let me and, go back to your explanation of fixer and translator because I think that's really important also for lay people to know you have a very close relationship to this female um, fixer as you as uh, it's called in the in the business um, you said that she doesn't live in Ukraine anymore but you're still in touch with her um, tell us what the fixer does for you in a totalitarian government or in a totalitarian Country. Yeah, well, well, we should specify what the fixer and translator do in any country where the yeah. language is not English and you're not fluent in that language. And, and what they're doing is, is saving you time and money. You're paying them for their services, but they're getting you press credentials if you need it. They're getting you appointments with individuals if you need that. As a, as a photographer, I don't need that so much because I'm not doing interviews. But what we do need is subjects uh, to photograph and things have to be set up. And if you wait until you get on the ground to do that, obviously you're gonna be spending money in hotels and such. And, and so we try to do all these things ahead as much as possible. So when that you fly in, things are organized and especially in, uh, in dealing with governments that are very bureaucratic, these things can take a lot of time. So even applying for a press credential in Ukraine had to be done a, a month ahead of time, if not more so. so. So as you can imagine, yeah, it's not just a visa, it's everything that's involved in doing the story uh, that their job is to help you organize that. And so, so they're, they're more or less a producer. I mean, in, with documentary films, the, the, you know, the title is more producer. But in effect, it's, you know, they're always doing the translating if you're in a country where English is not spoken. Paula, you um, said earlier um, when we started talking about Ukraine that there's also an interest that you have as a female war photographer. Of course, when I introduced you, I said you were one of the leading war photographers in the world and certainly um, unique. 
as a as a female war photographer tell us a little bit about this uh, you know this gender issue here we see very intimate portraits women old women in the bedroom they look hungry and starved and you can almost you know get a sense for the for the enclosed uh, spaces they are in and this the poverty and maybe also the loneliness so does it uh, make a difference for you that you that these are subject matters that you seek out because you have this kind of compassion do you think that the people who work with you also love to have you around because you're a woman and your fixer and translator is a woman um, could you tell us a little bit about that Well, as you can imagine, it's more comforting. First of all, if you're entering someone's home and you have to, you know, she, she's introducing me, let's say we're entering her home, the woman with the dog. I really, really like this shot because I knew that in many cases, um, pets are given by, or, uh, by, you know, many organizations to help the elderly get over being alone, especially if their husbands have already passed away. And so I felt like it was important to get uh, photos of some of the elderly with their pets because it's so true. But, but female to female in many cultures, yes, there's a trust that happens. There's, there has to be an understanding of why am I, why am I going to document them? If someone's letting you enter their home, yeah. In Ukraine, it's not a problem, culturally speaking, but in Afghanistan, it's a big problem because you have to get permission from a male elder or brother or some head of household male. The female cannot just say, yes, yeah, come on in. Mm. Uh, so it's a layer. It's another layer of, of cultural. Uh, what's the word? It's just it just can be really really caused problems in this case we didn't have problems with access everybody welcomed us in and they really were happy that we cared now you have to realize that that's very important because if they're in dire straits and they have this feeling that no one cares anymore and they're alone and their family lives far away moved to kiev from eastern ukraine uh to to move away from the war for them just having people that care is really really something unique and especially in a country like Ukraine because the healthcare system doesn't really benefit the elderly enough. The elderly have a very difficult time. And uh, so here we see someone, you know, it's extremely cold in Ukraine in the winter and we mostly went in the winter because we had to show, we had to tell more of a visual story of, of the difficulties that exist in the winter. Um, you, are, you are an American photographer and uh, it's interesting when I listen to you that I also think uh, when you come to the United States, you come also like an international or a cosmopolitan person. You look at the United States as if it was Ukraine in some ways, you know, that it's a, like an, another country. But uh, when you travel as an American to Ukraine or Afghanistan or Myanmar, um, does it make a difference that you're American now compared to several years ago? Do you feel that you as an American photographer, um, you get embraced because you're Paula Bronstein um, and it doesn't matter what nationality you have or um, has it become more difficult to come with an American press pass into a Muslim country? Well, we can go back before the Trump administration because anything to do with war and conflict, who started the war, okay? Yeah. Uh, and we know the answer to that before we start that question. Quite often it's America, not starting it, but you know, the revenge attacks after 9-11 started in 2001. Revenge attacks from the US, the bombing of southern Afghanistan. You know, I went into Afghanistan in, early December of 2001, when the bombings subsided. But we have to talk about that because, because the attitude from the people where you are going to visit is very much political. 
whether they like whether they liked Clinton, whether they liked Bush, whether they, you know, everybody has something to say about Trump. Let's not, you know, obviously we know that. Uh, he's in the news way more than previous presidents and mostly not a, because of positive reasons. But you're always going to run into that. And if you choose to say, and I'm going to be honest, sometimes I said I was Canadian. When I was working in Afghanistan, sometimes it's much easier not to say I'm American for political reasons. You're not going to say something that's going to put you, you know, into a hot spot. Yes. And you don't want some, in, you know, it, it, that goes for religion as well. If I'm working in some Muslim countries and I don't want to emphasize the fact that I'm Jewish, I won't talk about it. Yeah. And no one, you know, not that they know my last name or they can tell from my last name. So it's just not talked about, yeah. you know. Uh, so it's best to be smart about those kinds of cultural and political issues, depending on the country you go to, so that you don't inflame any tensions, especially if that's not your <laughs> mission at all. You know, you're there for completely different reasons. So it's just being smart, you know. It's just incredible when I think about all the places you have been, we, we try to narrow down because you've also been to Gaza, you've been to Iraq, you've been, like you said, to Hong Kong, um, you've traveled all over the world and seen so many uh, crisis uh, hotspots. But what I find incredible, Paula, is that you are also so to say there with a mission that you want to shed light on people who are not covered enough, who are not in the limelight, who are not, so to say, where the press moves on. And so, like we said earlier today, there are uh, two exhibits about the Rohingya. Tell us a little bit what you um, love about that uh, subject because you have gone back, you have gone back on your own will, even without having, so to say, an assignment. So tell us about these places that you seek out because you feel that there's a commitment that you want to make to have these stories be told. Right. So, but I was glad that you brought up the, the you know, you know, I mean, in terms of where I travel and how I have to present myself and stuff, because I was just going to finish with that, but during the Obama administration, it was probably, Obama was probably the, the most well-liked president yeah. <laughs> that the, the, the United States has had in decades. So um, besides Clinton, uh, but let's go back to the, we're, we're moving on from Ukraine to the Rohingya and, and yes, uh, this, so, so, so I started covering the Rohingya in 2012, 2013, I was making frequent trips to Myanmar where their camps were. Now, all of these photographs you're going to look at were taken in 2017, and we see a drone shot of one of the largest of the many refugee camps that exist in this one area of Bangladesh called Cox's Bazaar. And the reason why they they are there is because it was the, it's actually, if you look on the map, you'll see it's, it's quite a short distance by boat from, um, from Myanmar to the Bangladesh border. So for the refugees, this is where they arrived and where they ended up staying. And so in 2017, when the world was, was shocked and disturbed by these kinds of images. Uh, you know, for, for me, I mean, this was an extremely difficult story to cover because it was intensely hot. It was, you know, uh, you, you know, there were all sorts of problems of how we got to get these kinds of pictures of the, of the refugees, the, the, the intense, you know, the, for the Rohingya, they, they just were, going through hell, they really were. And it was important to show that. And this child crying to me really told the story because they were waiting and waiting and waiting uh, in these rice paddies to be let into the country. I think we can go to the next one and it might show that. 
No, I wasn't sure of the exact order. But if we, if we, the crying girl at the time I took that, she, uh, she was with her family, uh, carrying her own belongings. They hadn't had re- sleep or proper food for days. They were exhausted, uh, heat exhaustion and dehydration, very common. And, and they were just waiting to be let in. So there was so much question about what the Bangladesh authorities were going to do. And, and here we really get a sense of how they were all coming in, you know, through the mud and in these rice paddies, uh, many of them barefoot, carrying their own belongings, the, you know, the stronger carrying the, the weaker uh, and the, you know, the sick. And so it's just monumental, you know, just this is the largest, this is the fastest growing refugee camp in the world at the time. So now we have over 750,000 living in the camps. Um, And again, these are the photos I took uh, from September, 2017 to December. So that's how long I was there continuously doing the coverage. Because at that time, that was really, really uh, an incredibly important story and probably the, the most uh, compelling refugee story I had ever covered. I mean, I am not surprised that one exhibit about the Rohingya is in Dubrovnik and another one in Iran, that you find a way to represent um, these refugees that is that is so gut-wrenching. But maybe if we go back one more time to the previous picture, what I see in this picture and this one is that you you have, I mean, it's, it's like a painting. This looks like a 19th century painting of this uh, sinking ship or something like that with this young uh, man in the front carrying a person who, who could be a child, but maybe also an older person. I mean, it's it's a, an incredible look. It's almost pastoral, this, this suffering. Um, is that something, Paula, that you just have as a gift that you that that there is this beauty along with this suffering? I mean, I just I just find it incredible looking at this picture. Well, has this arch. I know we're running. I know we're running. I know. Well, okay. So so I know we're running a bit short on time. So so just to be more exact about how I photograph. Oh, it looks like we have problems with the internet. Are we, okay? are we still online? Yes, I think we are. Okay, okay. I saw something come over the internet's unstable. Um, you know, how for me, getting people to take notice, uh, creating a, a photo is difficult as it is to look at this photo. Um, it's so important to show the amount of people crossing at the time I shot this was, it was late in the day. So we didn't have the harsh light that exists earlier in the day. That's a kind of a matter of luck. This is a news story. You don't choose the time you photograph. You can go out early morning, you can stay till dusk, but sometimes those moments don't happen. In this case, on this day it did. And, and it was a very big news day because there were thousands that had crossed on this particular day. So it was so important to show that. And tell you know it's a storytelling picture, and that's what makes it, uh, to me, one one of the more compelling and moving pictures that, that I've taken of the Rohingya story. Yeah. Um, you know, so so again, we have to you you know it's just if we look at all of them, I, the the ones that I've chosen, especially for this talk, say something different. You know, here's here's an elderly man. Uh, who came, but at the time, you know, it was, it was the rainy season. So you get this wonderful situation of rain and then the sun comes out. And of course you got rainbows sometimes. So just to show some beauty in the midst of, you know, and with the late afternoon warm light as well. And he's, he's, his, his face was just so incredible. And, and it just important to show that, you know, elderly made this trip with their families and the families may have six to eight children. They're very large families and, and nobody was left behind. 
Paula, we are moving, so to say, into the last phase of the part where we uh, talk to each other. The next pictures are all about Afghanistan and there are lots of portraits, lots of portraits of women and having read your, your incredible book, um, many of these women burned themselves and are victims of domestic violence. So um, this is also the young woman who is on the cover of your book. I'm making another pitch for this absolutely wonderful book. Um, tell us about Afghanistan and uh, your choice for our talk to show these portraits of, of mostly women. Well, first of all, in Afghanistan, you have so many human rights issues that exist that it's important to tell those stories and highlight those problems because, because it, in a conservative Islamic culture, it's quite common for women not to have the same voice as a man. So, that, uh, and in this case, we're talking about a, a woman who was so abused over so many years because some of them are sold off at a very young age to men that could be three times their age or even more. Uh, and, and so they do something to themselves so that they're not beautiful anymore. And in this case, it's self-immolation. So, you know, you, you can imagine what it takes to get to that point, that level of depression where you, where you do this to yourself, basically try to kill yourself. This is a photo I took last year in the hospital that I've worked at uh, many times, the emergency hospital, it's an Italian run hospital that only deals with war victims. So it's very important for me to go back there over the years because I've, it's, it's a continuing subject for me is the subject of, of, you know, especially the children who are affected by war. I mean, the war victims, you know, I usually just say they're silent victims of war. Why? Because, you know, so many of them get caught in the crossfire, uh, not knowing, or they, it could be farmers that are working on their field and, and still the mines are, are there and they're getting blown up or losing a limb. So, so this hospital only deals with war and conflict. You cannot get treated there if you have a heart attack. <laughs> so this is where I worked uh, quite often and in order to continue to update this topic on the war wounded. I mean, what is striking me now is that, that you don't see masks. You know, there's an intimacy in that picture when everybody is leaning over this boy. And now that we are in the pandemic, we have very different, so to say, impressions of, of hospitals, but it's, it's extraordinary um, how you captured that moment. And the other picture, the next one that- Yeah, there's no, there's no masks in that picture. No. In, in that emergency room, nobody's wearing masks. They would uh, probably, you know, in, they would certainly in an ICU unit, uh, inter intensive care unit, but not in the emergency room. It's, it's a different. It's a different like time a, now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, this is almost like a pietà, so like a almost this religious um, connotation. It's an extraordinary picture, and it's in the same hospital. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, I, I as I said, I kept on. I worked at that hospital because there. You know, I the work they were doing was absolutely extraordinary. The level of care, the quality of the hospital, because it's strictly a tie and run, uh, with great. So, so for me, that you know, I was really quite fortunate to have access to to that facility. It was also a safe place to work. Yeah, this is an image that goes back to two thousand two, uh, a bullet ridden wall which was quite common at that time, because as most of you know, uh, you know, the United States, well, after 9-11, you know, a lot of the bombing started and a lot of the, the, the city still had the fresh wounds of that in 2002 when this was taken, before buildings were repaired or walls were painted. 
And so she's outside a clinic waiting to be seen and the marks on her face are from uh, sand fleas that bite and leave scars, small scars, and they get and it gets infected. And the this the skin disease is called leishmaniasis. So she was going to get treatment for that. And so you you um, went to a different location here, and you have this motif with the older person and the and the young person. Where where was this taken? So this was taken in a makeshift refugee camp. Uh, uh, so often in war, people get shifted many times because their houses were bombed or something happened to them to force them to flee their villages. And it's always violence. So they were in a temporary refugee camp and we went to visit. I was with a writer at the time. We went to visit that refugee camp. And, and so a lot of it, I can't really say it's a, it's, it's an informal portrait of sorts. It's of, of refugees, you know, you know, and so you can see it's a tent because kids are looking at us from the back of the tent. You, uh, you also said um, when we did the pre-interview that the fixers in Afghanistan are very different from what you encountered, for example, in Ukraine, where these shots, for example, this woman um, begging, is that something that you saw on your own or were you always with the fixer and translator in Afghanistan? Uh, in Afghanistan, because I'm a, a woman, I'm, I'm not on the streets by myself. So even if I'm just with a driver, he's going to get out of the car with me. Very rare that I would be on the streets by myself. I just don't do that. Uh, it's, I'm not comfortable with it. And especially from carrying cameras, as you can imagine, it's not very smart to, you know, But, but let's get to the photo because I know we only have a few minutes left. I, 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 did a, I did a story on widows and this was part of my widow project. Um, and, and widows are often found on the streets begging in the city of Kabul. And that's a longer story about how they become impoverished. But it's mostly because they're not, you know, maybe their husband was a soldier and he got killed in, the, in many years of war that... that The country has been affected by, uh, and and they're only given they're given such small amounts of money that they can barely survive, and so they depend on their children to help with that. You know, you know, it's so so often you'll see women on the streets begging, and I know it's sad, but it's true. And so I had to show that she's waiting for bread. So we go to the next one. I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, here, here, it's just it's just kids at play. They're, they're, it's 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 soccer practice. Uh, so again, a different a different mood. Uh, but we still have the war in the background. We this this palace has now been completely renovated and it's beautiful. Oh yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. One of uh, something that that is is a is it's nice to hear something positive. But, but a lot of these old war relics, uh, the money uh, came in from the EU, et cetera, from the US to, to renovate. And uh, in a way, I'm glad that I, that photo is, you know, the photo is very important because you can't see that building anymore. So another, again, another feeling, a feeling of, you know, doves and peace and the, These uh, the women were women and children were feeding feeding the pigeons and uh, outside of a mosque, a very famous mosque in Mazar Sharif. So I love the white, the fact they were white and the burqa's white. And then the little girls are wearing their their they're veiled, but they don't have the burqa's yet. I I noticed that you um, you've done incredible pictures with burqa's um, and women wearing burqa's. Well, it's such a, it, 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 it's seen everywhere. You know, usually a, a child above the age of 12 might start wearing, depending on the family. Um, it's not to say that all would, some would just wear a headscarf, but quite often uh, as, as the girl starts to mature and the family decides that they don't want her seen, 
by mm. strange men. That's of course what the veil is about in many Muslim countries, not just Afghanistan. So, um, and and here just another. It's just I love this old man. He was he's part of a story I did for the Wall Street Journal about families that lived on these hills that surround uh, Kabul. Uh, and uh, in this country, we're used to real estate with a view. You pay more money, but that's not the case of people who live on the hills and in yeah. Kabul. They don't have running water, many of them. They don't have proper roads going up to the residents. Uh, and so there's, there's many, many problems, especially in the wintertime. The kite the yeah, the kite flyer. That's the back of my book. So if you turn, if you lift up the book and you, my book again, you can show the back. Yes. This book, I must say, Paula, I, I told you, I think it's one of the most beautiful photo books I've ever seen. It's, it's published by the University of Texas Press and the design is incredible and you can really lose yourself watching these images. So as you can see, it's an it's a incredible format, but I really highly recommend that you that well you thank you for that thank you i'm glad it's so touched there. that you you yeah and and for every, and i think we put down my contact information in terms of here we go here we go so my instagram pbb photo uh website any of you that want to reach out to me on my email it's fine uh for for questions more than happy to answer any questions so i think it's interesting that you said that your facebook you have 5000 facebook friends and you can't accept any more <laughs> because uh, you facebook books puts the kibosh on well uh, i don't know why facebook has a limit i mean instagram you can have a million followers if you're such celebrity but for some reason that i have i really don't understand that so i apologize if people are trying to reach out to me be friends and I have to delete others to <laughs> accept. I mean, we felt that that it was so incredibly lucky that we were able to interview you for, for this series. And Jennifer Boyd, who is the founding member, member of the um, BFFs, um, immediately- I love that title. Out. That is such <laughs> a great title. <laughs> so, I don't know who came up with the title, but it's fantastic. Yeah. Maybe Jennifer so did. We, we have a number of questions. So I'm just going to um, ask you, Paula, do you want, are you comfortable if we just show you here and not your contact information? We can certainly bring it up again um, mm -hmm. if people haven't noted it down. So Suzanne Colton is asking, even if fixers and translator in place, how many times in your career have you been asked, please take me with you? Ah, that's a very good question. And that's happened a number of times, uh, especially in Afghanistan, because uh, as many of you may know, Afghans have tried to, you know, they, they especially in 2015, there were so many that left. I am, you know, they were amongst uh, the Syrians, probably the largest number next to the Syrians. Uh, um, trying to flee their country because of economic difficulties, high unemployment, you know, just, just fleeing again, fleeing war and, and, and economic hardship. Uh, so yes, I have had that question, especially from the Afghans because it's so, especially now, if you think about, you know, what the Trump administration has done, but it's, it's become more and more difficult, especially to immigrate to the United States. Course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for example, this image that we saw of the young girl carrying all her belongings and the Rohingya, would you be able to track her down and uh, see her again and see what happened to her? Or is this is kind of a once in a lifetime chance? And then um, on. it would be if, if you think about what it's like, unless you well, even if you have a tent number or a section number in a refugee camp, they may have moved. Yeah. You know, they, they're very, very likely that they, they might have moved for any number of reasons because the camps were always expanding and, you know, maybe one section got flooded out because of rain or who knows what, why, or, you know. 
Uh, so the answer is that there's no possible way I would ever be able to find her. To think that you capture moments that become iconic for the flight of refugees in Rohingya and then the refugees themselves will probably never see this picture but this young woman will stay with us for the next few days and uh, um, yeah I think it's extraordinary because your pictures are so captivating or this uh, this man without teeth overlooking the the hills I mean these are pictures that are just ingrained in your memory and uh, well, sometimes you know that you you probably would not be able to see this person again but I would love to follow up if if at all possible uh, there are many Rohingya refugees that I did follow up with because I could uh, if you know especially some of the rape victims that we interviewed um, who later went on to have children uh, that came from rape you know there's all sorts of you, you need to follow up whenever possible but in many situations especially as you can imagine with almost a million well present day I think we're around 750,000 uh, separated into dozens of camps here in the United States no I'm talking about the Rohingya specifically yeah. Rohingya. I mean, that's sorry that I brought this up because I think that there are some we talked about this too some situations that were unthinkable to happen in the United States, but are now happening here as well. So that uh, it's uh, a really difficult time. We have another question from one of the founding members of the VFFs, uh, Carol Evans. And uh, she asks a very personal question. Have you suffered from PTSD with all the violence you have covered in your career? Um, I think PTSD, I think you have to, Have I suffered, I would say, sometimes, but it would be more from something recent that happened, if you're following me. So it could have been after covering a natural disaster uh, where I saw way too much death. And then, of course, the smell of death stays with you. There's certain, it's proven that you know, is soldier, the veterans that suffer PTSD, it's, it's these very specific situations that they're usually drawn back to it. Um, so, so over the years, yes, there has been specific situations where, uh, you know, where it was just really too difficult or too intense and, and, and it's only natural. I think it's really important for you know, you recognize it, you, you do what you can to, how do you move on mentally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having that understanding and um, what you do to relax after situations like this. You know, nobody, I don't care who you work for, you know, no, it's very hard for, even, even covering the Rohingya, you're seeing so much suffering uh, of people and there's so much you can't do about it. You're documenting it, but it doesn't mean you can fix their problems. Yeah. So, so, so this, this, this it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard for not just myself, for, for any media who do what I do. Yeah. Um, Agnes Morshi is also asking about uh, the women you have encountered and, and uh, that links to this earlier question about getting access, but also your ability to create this uh, emotional bond with people, even if you don't speak their language. So she asks, uh, do you sometimes feel like uh, an intruder when you, when you document this misery and suffering and how do you cope and handle not be potentially making your subjects feel taken advantage of? Um, that's a difficult question. So it's kind of a, a, a a larger question and I don't know how, <laughs> um, a lot of that is built on trust. So, so that's why when we were talking about uh, the Ukraine story and the elderly, they immediately, for, for the elderly that led us in there, were so happy to bond with us and to tell us their stories and to have me document them in their homes. Um, but it does, you know, it's, A lot of times, depending on the culture, again, it's what is in it 
for me. Yes. And maybe it's best to use, go back to the Rohingya story briefly. Uh, a lot of media at one point in time were, were talking about the rape of the Rohingya mm -hmm. for many, many reasons that are all very, very important. And especially the the children that were being born from rape and so so you can imagine and everything is you know we don't have the time to go into all the details about that but that those would try to try to be that woman who's been interviewed by eight to ten different reporters at some point she's going to say wait a minute are you going to pay me yes what's in it for me i've told my story numerous times yeah i want to tell the world about our suffering the suffering of the rohingya people but again what's it you know this happened with the afghans it, it has happened many times and it makes sense yeah uh because also they look at media that come in fly into a situation you know and then we leave we go back to our homes we go back to our families uh, in our normal way of living. But when whatever you're covering, you know, that that's you're gonna run into that situation, whether it's the aftermath of an earthquake and people have had everything yeah. destroyed. You just hope that your photographs are bringing attention to the, their plight. And that's all you can tell them is, is why you're there. You know, I, I, I use the rape, I just use that. I think that's a very ethical, more of an ethical issue of, what happens sometimes when when international tension just is so drawn to one story in particular as it was with Rohingya there you know I felt like okay let's maybe we should leave these women alone you know you know it's 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 horrific to hear their tales and you know hear these stories over and over again but it is also difficult for them to tell those stories yeah um Paula, you put yourself in danger. You are gutsy and brave and extraordinary in this uh, curiosity. Um, what kind of uh, training do you get to sense difficult situations? How do you get out of difficult situations? Uh, I have a question here. Um, is there something that you can do when you get arrested or when you get into danger? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that because you are a war photographer. Well, I think that's a real general question though. And I don't think there's, I can't give you a straight answer. Here's what you do because it depends on where you are, yes. what the situation is, what the, what the threat is. Is it live bullets or are they Pelican? Is it, you know what I mean? Is it, is it, I mean, if we bring it to present day protest. Yeah. Uh, assessing the, the problems and having knowledge of the best way to try and deal with what the situation is going to be like. And, and um, I don't know if I'm asking, answering the question directly enough, but I, that, I just, it's a bit broad. So in the time we have, I think it'd be hard to answer it completely. I mean, I know that, that some um, journalists getting training that if they work in sort of say, Hostile that's very, yeah, that's very common now, the hostile environment training, yeah. Yes, and you were to be captured, what would you, uh, how would you behave, what would you release, do you break down if you get uh, mistreated, I mean, this, those are... It's terrifying. extremely important, extremely important, uh, out of all the, the different clients that I work with, the Wall Street Journal is, is the newspaper that, since I've come here, had a, a one hour webinar with security advisor, even showing how to put on a mask, uh, talking to me specifically about how to wash my gas mask. Yeah. Very practical information that I may not know because I don't wear a gas mask every day and I certainly don't wear a mask every day until COVID hit. Even though you know I was based in Asia, it is of course culturally a cultural norm to wear masks in most of Asia. Uh, but still, so again, understanding and learning each time, you know, many of us have learned or had to learn, I mean, you know, how to deal with uh, 
working in, in the midst of a pandemic, something you can't see and smell. How do you do it? How do you keep safe? Not easy. You said that you don't want to photograph something that you can't see and smell. But well, it's a lot more difficult. <laughs> I didn't cover Ebola, but I did cover SARS in Asia. Uh, you asked me about Ebola was one of the questions. Uh, but again, it's a matter, okay, how do you keep safe? And right now, the coronavirus is it's the worst case scenario. Every day, there's more information coming out about, because there's too many questions and people don't know. So everybody is worried and, and, and you know, we don't understand enough about it. So, you know, just trying to keep safe is all you can do with everything that's being told about, you know, what we're supposed to do as media. Uh, but, but yeah, it is, it is worrisome. If you're going to follow emergency medical teams that pick up sick people, if you're going to go into a hospital, then you're taking on another layer of, of, of very serious potential threat. And I'm not in my twenties anymore. I'm in my sixties. So let's be clear about this. <laughs> I mean, I'm extremely healthy, but again, being smart and staying healthy is what my aim is. You said something on photographing in Afghanistan. You said, I would not leave a car without the driver. And uh, especially with the equipment that is very noticeable. And that's actually a question of uh, your friend, Jennifer Boyd, who is a documentary filmmaker and uh, a really bad ass filmmaker. <laughs> bad. So she's asking, talk about how you use cell phones. Yes, she is badass. She Never. is badass. <laughs> and stills as a tool, when it is helpful <laughs> to use a cell phone instead of a higher end camera. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, I have a thousand dollar cell phone I can use instead of a higher end camera, but I don't do it instead. It's another tool. It's another tool. Uh, yeah, my iPhone has become, especially with video, especially it's incredible with, with shooting video at night at these protests. Uh, so yeah, uh, but, the, but ha, you know, I mean, we, we need to have our professional equipment with us on our, on our shoulders, ready, ready to be used. So, um, and they're insured. So, you know, I have to, Of course, I want to take them with me, but, but I, I, I think the point was if I was getting, if I was in the streets of Kabul, would I have both cameras around my neck? Probably not. One would be left in the car or, you know, out of sight. Yeah, so many times I might not carry two cameras, depending on the situation, you know, if I thought there was, you know, and, and, and especially in Kabul, the, the person who's walking with me was all, I, many times I would say, I want you to be right behind me or whatever, so you can watch, you know, where, where theft is, is, is a real problem. Paula, are there other women photographers that you, that you adore to work with, or are you somebody who is uh, very comfortable being the only female with eight other um, male photographers. I mean, are you are you a lone wolf? Do you like to have company? Do you trust your fixers more than other colleagues? What what the? How would you answer that? That's a lot of. It's a number of different questions. Uh, definitely not a lone wolf. I'm a very social person. I like to be around people. <laughs> it's part of why I do what I do. You know. I want to, you know, uh, anybody who knows me well knows that I'm extremely social and, uh, and it's actually been difficult during coronavirus because as you, as you well know, everybody's social distancing and everything that's going on is, makes it more difficult just to visit friends because, you know, I'm here in the States temporarily. So, um, And then do you stay in touch with other female photographers to see what they are doing, what they are up to, or do you? Oh, sure. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's easy enough, you know, when everybody's messaging on Facebook messenger or whatever, you know, that's easy enough to stay in touch. And, and especially different time zones, 
I use WhatsApp a lot because WhatsApp, uh, it's, it's just easier with different time zones because I'm not in Bangkok now where I'm normally based covering the Asian region. Uh, in fact, I, you know, probably three, four times a week, I'm still speaking with or messaging with people in Asia about what's going on and, this, you know, or, you know, I, I very much the global person. I'm dealing with future exhibitions. I have one coming up early next year near Dubai uh, on, on Afghanistan, actually. Most of the, you know, that's a very big exhibition that's going to happen. And I hope I can go. I can actually be there. <laughs> I hope I can travel there. I, I, I believe I can. It's quite a ways away. So are you... Are you glad that you had this little interlude where you were in Portland so to say for a while and touched base again or are you so to say itching to get back to Asia to your home base well I mean it's it's pretty difficult you know paying rent and not even being able to stay in my apartment and normally because the way my job has worked over many years of being based overseas is that I'm covering a region I'm not just covering Thailand. I'm covering a, a region and obviously going to Afghanistan many times. And so really moving around a lot, um, which is a very common, this is extremely common for international correspondents, whether they're based in Nairobi or Istanbul or Bangkok. The problem is many of us are, because of coronavirus, caught in a different part of the world and with borders uh, not opening, some are, some are not. Thailand is really not, uh, you know, it's, it's preventing me from going back at the moment. And normally I do Airbnb and I'm not able to do that right now either, so. So we are coming to the end and uh, the question that you might uh, expect is, so to say, do you have some words of advice to the young photographer from Minneapolis who stood next to you in Portland and uh, maybe had this idea of becoming a photojournalist. What, what do you want uh, people who enter your field to know? Because you, you have enthralled us <laughs> into the complexity of being an international war photographer and, and the challenges that come along with it. But what do you think are some of the things that you want people to know who start this career? Well, look at, I think, I, I do think that a lot of young photographers are so excited about being there in the moment and, and documenting history. And if we look at everything that's gone on in the United States this year, it's pretty historical. And on the election coming up, uh, I'll stay through the elections for the same reason. It's extremely important and historical. Um, I think it's much harder to make a living in editorial photography than before. The money is not there. The salaries have not gone up. Uh, they go up maybe, you know, just a small amount, but not enough to buy that new camera or, you know, it's very hard. And, and, and newspapers, of course, have cut way back on their staffs. Uh, I was very lucky to go to be at the Harper Current for 12 years when their news, when their staff was, it was really one of the best papers uh, regionally at that time. So I was extremely lucky, the pre-digital era to be at newspapers. Uh, really, really different now. We only have a handful of papers that can afford to continue to cover the international stories the way they used to. Um, And as I said, many, many photographers are no longer working at the newspapers because they've, they've thinned down their staffs to practically not, nobody. So it's, it's a very different time and everything's online. And yes, that can be great for photo display where you have beautiful galleries and they can show, you know, 20 to 30 photos. But on the other hand, what are you getting paid for those images? So, I think for what I'm talking about is, is, is it's, it's much harder to make a living yes. as a photojournalist than it was before. 
And it's mostly because if we look overall at salaries, day rates, they haven't gone up enough to match the expenses. You know, if you're a photographer, you want to get into, if you want to buy a drone, if you want to buy the new mirrorless camera, I can go on, you know, maybe you need a new computer. How do people afford all these things, you know? So not easy, not easy. It's not, you know, it takes a lot of passion and it takes a lot of will to say, okay, I can, you know, or, or maybe photographers subsidizing it by, by doing commercial work and even photographing weddings so they can take some of that savings and go off and do perhaps international stories that, you know, speak to them, you know, or get grants. Yeah. So, you know, it's I'm not trying to paint a negative picture. It's just, this is the reality today. I think that you are extraordinarily charismatic, Paula. And I remember today you said, after this, I'm going to go back to the protests And I said, why? And you said, I feel like it. <laughs> so I think you are undeterred and absolutely fantastic. And it's a huge, huge thank you. We all have towards you that you made this time for us today. Oh, so, well, thank you. This has been wonderful. Uh, that we can interview you again the next time you are, um, you are um, either in the States or maybe if we continue in this pandemic, um, twilight zone then we can <laughs> it is a twilight zone for sure we, we we hope that at least we can get the testing back to where it should be and even when i was in connecticut the testing was great and i think there's a national shortage right now like i, I was mentioning to you and especially with students needing to be tested before they go back to school you know there's so many challenges going on right now uh It's unbelievable. So anyways, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, I, it's been wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, and, and students, if you want to reach out to me separately, that's fine, whether on Facebook Messenger, uh, that might be the easiest. Uh, and my Instagram is pbbphoto. You can follow me there. And anyways, thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed it. So let's talk media. It's a wrap. We want you to stay safe, stay home, wear a mask and tune back with us in two weeks when uh, we have our next uh, show coming up. And uh, I'd like you to, in to invite you to uh, the next show on August 27 at five, taking advantage of opportunities, finding the network after graduation with filmmakers Tracy Heather Strain and Carol Evans. 6.30. Good night. Thank you, Paula, and stay safe. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.